Okay, we're going to get going here. So I'd like to introduce Lauren Greger. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Lauren is an agricultural engineer with PAMI. So Lauren is the project manager for agriculture research and development at PAMI in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Lauren's passion for agriculture began with his family farm roots in Swan Valley. He obtained a degree in agriculture engineering from the U of M. And after exploring engineer consulting and pharmaceutical sectors, Lauren returned to a career in agriculture with PAMI. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just gonna grab my bottle of water here. Today we're gonna talk a little bit about harvesting. I know it's a little bit premature with snow on the ground and being minus 23 or whatever it is today, but we just wanna start thinking ahead to come fall time. What can we do to maximize your profits that you've put in starting at springtime? You put a lot of money into seed, you put a lot of money into your uh, inputs. What can you do to maximize that particular uh, investment? We'll take you through a bit of the journey we looked at when we're looking at soybean harvest research that we've done at PAMI over the last years. Um, it's been a, a progression for us, and uh, I'll take you through that and the learnings that we've had each year to try and give you a foundation for where we ended up here in this most recent work here in uh, 2018. Just as a quick background, PAMI is a tri-provincial, or was a tri-provincial organization uh, created in the 70s. It's now in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. We work on a, a fee-for-service basis primarily, doing private research or working for independent companies, um, providing in information directly for them. Uh, work like this is done through public funds that we uh, provide, or are provided to us on a contract basis and allow us to disclose results to help uh, increase the understanding uh, for everyone involved in uh, farm production. You spend a lot of time on genetics and a lot of time on uh, variety development. One of the things that we think about is the cost of equipment, though, $3.8 billion on Manitoba farms. This slide is a little bit dated, it's actually gone up since then, $470 million per year on direct operating expenses. That's a significant amount of money that's being spent each year on the equipment side. We'd like to, if we, all possible, try and maximize the efficiency of your equipment operations in order to m maximize revenue at the end. Regardless of what variety you're using, regardless of what uh, funds are going into yield development or variety development, you still have to harvest that at the end. If we can save you 1%, 2% potentially and increase your revenue, that's our goal by providing some of this information for you. It's not going to be all at once, but there's going to be incremental gains potentially in terms of how you operate how you operate your equipment and what type of equipment that you operate looking at soybeans. Now, why is this so important? Well, when you're looking at 2017, it had over 2 million acres of beans in the province of Manitoba, slightly lower here in, in 2018. But if I can save you a bushel per acre, that's, that's $20 million $20 million per year that's direct back in your pocket through either equipment selection or operating methods. So that's what we're going to talk about here this morning, try and get through some of those details. Now, we're talking soybeans, if you look at the research out of the states, the majority of your losses are at the header. There's about a quarter percent lost before you even get into the field, whether it's a weather effect or animal loss. Um, another, uh, about half percent at your cylinder, and then in the separation losses, about a quarter to another half percent. So you're just over one percent just on combine operations. So the majority of our losses then are really coming at your header. So that's what we want to focus on. And really, the challenge that goes with soybeans is, is the height of that bottom pod when you're looking at that particular uh, soybean plant. And then also in terms of the loss, four seeds per square foot typically is what's counted as a bushel per acre loss. So if you start seeing a pod with, on the ground that's got three seeds in it, you're a better part of a way to having a bushel per acre uh, left behind in the field. I'd say the other challenge when you're looking at uh, combine at, th at harvest time as well, it doesn't have that same kind of feel compared to canola or cereal where you have a lot of material other than, than a grain that's slowing the machine down and automatically makes you slow down on your ground speed. So soybeans, there isn't that same kind of feedback that uh, allows you to uh, have that uh, operating uh, method. And other aspects here we'll look at are varieties in Manitoba. So we have shorter season varieties compared to states and how that plant physiology is can also affect what you're seeing for losses in terms of the uh, header itself. 
when you're looking at losses, we're going to look at four different types. So you'll see throughout the slides and the research that we've done in the field, there's going to be different types of losses that I'm going to talk about. So I'll just walk through those fairly quickly here to give you just an understanding of, of what I'm talking about when we're talking types of losses. So this is the first type of loss. This is what we considered a loose pod loss. And uh, you can see a pod here as an example. So it's intact, it's attached to the small stem still just on the ground. So that's one of the types of losses. And then you'll see, depending on your pod fill, three, two, three, four uh, seeds per pod. The uh, next type of loss we're going to look at would be bean losses themselves. Uh, if we can get there. So that'd be a loose, loose beans. So when you start to see our slides later on, you'll start to see that's the type of loss that I'm looking at. So if you have four of those in that square foot right there, that's a bushel and acre. So you start to see more and more beans per square foot. That's going to be a challenge in terms of what you're going to see in the grain tank. The next type of loss would be we could consider a stubble loss in this case. So it's uh, the, the stem still attached to the ground and it's just it's cut just above those bottom pods. So you're looking at your losses that you're going to see in terms of your header and can quickly add up if you're cutting above the ground. Again, the challenge with beans is that that bottom pod is so close to the ground. So trying to cut below the bottom pod without cutting the pod and, and leaving beans behind. And the last type we'll look at would be the lodged style of, of losses. So that's where the stem is actually laying down on the ground. So we haven't cut the stem, it's just been pushed over and you've leaving all your pods on the ground at that point. So one of the questions that we wanted to look at was, well, what can we do for operating method? This is our first uh, foray into doing this, the uh, soybean header loss work in Manitoba. And one of the things that I noticed when I'm driving through Manitoba are the styles. Some guys cut on an angle, some guys go straight up and down. So I understand why. Well, is there any benefit to looking at uh, that style of, of uh, field operation to, to either increase your uh, harvested uh, number of beans? So this is our, some work that we did in 2015, starting off looking at two different angles. We went on a 45 degree angle and then straight up and down at the rows. We did uh, multiple speeds, starting off slow and then working our way up, up to six mile an hour to try and get an assessment of where does that speed start to really make an effect in terms of the losses that you're seeing in the field. Uh, the variety we used and had a good stand, 41 bushels per acre that year. In this case, we used a 680 with a 40 foot flex draper uh, head for 2015. And this work we did, it was harvested on Thanksgiving weekend in October 10th, just for context of time of year for doing the work, as that can, I think, play into the, how the stand is, as well as the results that you're seeing. So these are results from our, our uh, going straight on, up and down at the rows. The total losses, which includes anything that was left in the field before we got in at the combine, compared to our blue line, which are total losses. And for context, so in, when we were doing this work, we'd, uh, we had dropped the... Uh, uh, left the straw chopper and then just count losses between the wheel track and essentially about two feet off the outer edge. We're trying to get that midpoint of both sides of the header. Um, in this case, we, also, we took about 20 samples so each time we did a treatment to try and then average that across there. Um, when you're looking at speed, we saw a fairly consistent increase in losses, total losses, as we got up to about four and four and a half, and from there it got a little more variable. And we'll, I just, Put this in context, this is our first foray into this, and one of the things that we found out was just number of samples required, so we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, also, this is our the loose beans, so we're starting to see increased beans on the ground as the speed increased, our, uh, and then our shatter, so that's beans on the ground, we're at the purple line. What we found fairly consistent across all speed ranges, though, was that our stubble and lodge losses, so still attached to the plant, just not captured, were quite low in this case. This is our 45 degree angle cut, so we're looking at our losses. We actually started off quite a bit higher as we were going really slow in the field, so we're actually getting the momentum to get the plants onto the head and to, uh, to actually get it into the, uh, uh, into the feeder house. So our losses went down as we got around to four to four and a half and then increased again as we increased our ground speed. One of the things we did see though were similar types of trends where the major losses were coming from our loose beans on the ground or pods that were dropped. Our overall stubble and lodge losses were relatively low in terms of the uh, overall losses. When we did a quick comparison of our main effects, whether it was speed, or in terms of our angle, um, those were the, the averages that we saw going across. Um, one of their main findings were 
go back one slide, was the variability. We just realized we needed just more samples. Unfortunately, uh, at this time of year, it's just too late. So we have another uh, uh, additional trials that we've done and increased our sampling to try and improve and quantify what those differences are. But focusing on the loosened pod being 90, 80 to 90 percent of our header losses, that's an area that we focused on moving forward. So the question was, what about air systems? See a lot of, a lot of heads out there, especially auger headers with the air system and wanted to understand what that effect would be. And so our next foray and, and taking in the next step was looking at trying to quantify, does this make a difference when you're combining? Can you actually realize reduced losses by using an air system? So this is our trial in 2016. We had an air system on an auger header, a 35 foot with a AWS system. And so we did eight, uh, eight different uh, replicates, or two, three, four, five mile an hour in this case. Uh, for a condition in terms of how the soybean samples were, this is our plant stand that we had and our bottom pot height being three and three quarter off the ground. And because of the additional sampling took, we counted a lot of beans this year. We had over 1,300 samples, so we, we really increased our sampling in order to try and quantify that and get a better handle on terms of what's the real effect on this. In this case, this is what we found for 2016. Uh, we saw a marked difference as we got up to that, that uh, five mile an hour. This speed had a dramatic difference. Now, what does this mean to you if you're going from four to five in this case with this, this type of header in these conditions in this year? Well, it's going to cost you at $10 a bushel, about $3,400 just by going four to five mile an hour. So that speed effect can have a dramatic difference in terms of where your operating efficiency is in your net return per year. When you're looking at, well, does that air system actually make a difference here in this case? In the trial that we did, we had about overall one bushel per acre loss uh, with a, an air reel, and then two and two quarter without an air reel. So we added one and a quarter bushels, uh, reduced losses by adding that system. When you look at that, again, in terms of the overall, what's that cost for the year? Well, that can be a dramatic savings, again, in terms of what that could be around $6,200 per year if you just look at what the air system could save you in terms of reduced losses for the year. So that's what we found for 2016, leaving us well two points, really. Harvest speed does make a difference um, to a point, and an air system can reduce losses in half in an auger header, but I would say part of the conversation when you're looking at headers is, uh, this, is, this is soybeans, what about, what about canola, what are you doing for uh, cereals? And really, if you look at some of those uh, options, and really the draper is really the question is, how does the draper perform um, with, the with reducing losses and, and potential for that? Um, taking it to 2017, 2018, this is where we've progressed to with our, our information is looking at draper headers now and adding an air system. I want to say thanks also to uh, growing forward too through Manitoba Agriculture, providing funds for all of our research as well as Crary in this case for providing an air system that we could add on to Draper header. One of the challenges that we found actually in setting this up was just couldn't find a header, a Draper header that had an air system on it, and they're good enough to provide a header system or a drape, or uh, an air system for us to add to the the Draper itself. So we ran two different header types. We had an auger header again, similar to what we did in 20, uh, 2016, and then a a flex draper in a 40 foot in, as well as comparison. And starting off again relatively slow, going two, four, five, six mile an hour, just to try and get an understanding of how much of an effect does that speed have on both of these header types. And trying to understand the correlation between air systems and, and uh, header type as well as speed. We did 20 treatments, four reps of each, so we had 80, 80 uh, field scale plots we cut that year. And this work was done in 2013, or October 13th uh, of uh, 2017. I'll make a comment too. One of the things about doing any kind of field research, you need to expand it over more than one season. There's a lot of different uh, variables when you look at your stand. 2017, it was a dry summer, and I would say that our, we had a, a lower yield. They don't have the yields here right now, and a dry fall. So that will also have an impact in terms of what we're seeing for efficiency and loss. We did our pre-harvest loss again, trying to understand that, and just want to make a note here too, but when you're talking about pod heights, this is the location that we're saying for pod heights. So if it's three inches off the ground, it's the connection point to the pod to the main stem. 
So you have to actually cut below that bottom pod if you do want to open up and shatter and have loose seats in the ground. So that's really, when you're looking at the challenge, that's it right there is that particular, uh, uh, that particular uh, height difference. And in this case, it, it was uh, 30 bush and acre yields, which is a little bit lower than typically you'd have for beans here in Manitoba a majority of the time. Uh, just to take a quick look at the headers themselves, and so this is trying to get a, a picture of the interface of the knife to the, to the head on an auger header in the beans with the uh, air system as well. And then on the uh, draper header here, looking at that intersection. Can, and that to me, when I take a step back and look at your overall dimensions, you have to cut that plant below the bottom pod, get it up over top of any, uh, uh, any other components, and then onto the draper to convey it into your feeder house. So that's really the challenge, is getting it across that transition, cutting below that bottom pod, and maintaining your material flow into your, into your header. This is what we found, starting off with looking at your two different header types, draper with air and then draper without an air. So you look at uh, these two different trials across all speeds, I mean, it had quite a difference actually. We were almost three bushel and an acre uh, losses compared to 1.7 or so when, you had, uh, when we added air to the draper header. And very similar actually for the auger, slightly higher losses with the auger um, with air and then a little bit lower with auger without air. So that was the first real understanding is, yeah, it does make a difference to both those header types when we're looking at, uh, at an air system potentially to either an auger or a draper header. Um, one of the things I always look at though is how does that uh, go in terms of where your losses are occurring and across uh, all these trials again, it's really that the uh, pod losses and drop seed, that's where you're seeing your reduction in terms of your losses at the header. So anything you can do to maintain and get those, those cut pods and the loose seeds into your, into your combine and the, into the grain tank, that's, that's really key. Um, and that's where these losses are, are, are really coming from across all the different uh, header types. So in terms of your overall speeds, this is what it looks like for your draper with air and draper without air. So those are your total losses. We could break it down a little bit further and, and see where those losses start to increase as your speeds increase. Uh, one of the things I found quite interesting though is, is kind of the trends. That's what I always look at. It's a little bit jagged here. So we're looking at some more data to understand what's the overall effect. Um, what you can say is, is with consistency, the draper header had a lower losses um, when adding air uh, compared to not, and same with the auger header as well. And speed has a higher, again, has a more of an impact when you start looking at your, your auger header. Uh, as you're going faster, you're starting to lose more, more seeds and uh, leave them behind, leave them behind uh, seeds in the field. Uh, in terms of what does that look like for uh, losses, oh, backwards here auger with an air and without air. So this is doing a comparison of your speed and you can see as you're starting to take off these, these loose seeds and drop pods are really what's increasing as the speed increases when you don't have air on it. So that's where your main source of losses are coming from, from your header. And similar type of, uh, similar type of pattern for the draper header as well. Adding the air reduces those drop pods and those loose seeds from the ground. That's where you're seeing your efficiency gain. What are our conclusions? Well, uh, ground speed did not have a significant effect on losses as much. Um, didn't see a, a real significant performance of uh, difference between the draper and auger header, but you did see it when you added air, reducing it by about one, uh, one bushel per acre overall. And I guess that one of the things I would say, I just encourage you guys to, if you can, stop and check and see, uh, see what your header is doing and see what your losses are throughout the day. That's something that we haven't taken into account here. Uh, I'll say, just note a caution with that, that was one year of data in a uh, little bit lower yielding field than we would have expected. It was a dry season in August uh, and just in one variety. Uh, one other thing that we wanted to, to understand that is actually taking it to the next step here and, and doing a second treatment on that. Uh, in this case, we are able to uh, work with our a local producer and, and uh, had a, a Macton Draper header as well as a John Deere uh, auger header. Looking at a similar style of setup again, taking multiple speeds, going up to seven mile an hour. One thing that I keep hearing from uh, producers is, oh, I, want, I go seven mile an hour, so I want to understand what does that look like in terms of your losses when you're adding, um, adding the, uh, the losses at the header. And again, 2018 had a, had a good stand at uh, 42 bushel an acre, and this is the variety that we used. Um, 
this year in 2017, we, were all, we harvested October 22nd, so we got caught in that wet spell as well and came off a little bit later than some of the other trials that we had done. This is some of the preliminary findings we have, and I'll just say a word of caution. We're still going through all the statistical analysis and the data. I didn't have a chance to, to get all that into a spot where well, it's a, a real solid uh, report at this point, but we're continuing to do that here through the end of March. We did see a similar trend, though, when you're looking at adding your two different systems. Uh, one more point of the, uh, uh, on this trial from 2018. We added GoPro um, cameras to our headers in 2017 to try and understand what's happening in the field and that knife to uh, ground interface and plant interface. And, and one of the things that we did see as you're going across the, the topography of the field, as your header starts to lift, we're starting to see, I think, more beans being cut and that bottom pod being, being clipped uh, by the knife. So one of the things that uh, I was really interested in is, is that angle of your header and how much of an effect that does that have if you don't adjust your header angle from a, say, a serial setting to a bean uh, setting as recommended by, um, by the manufacturer. This is one of the other trials that we did this year in 2018, was just adjusting that angle and seeing what a steeper angle does in order to see if that, that operating method really does have an effect in losses. And this is what we found, actually. So what we have are two different lines here, blue and red or auger, with and without air. So this is our without air, and this is uh, with air. Blue lines, our draper with a set for our bean setting, so a real steep angle, trying to cut on, on and blow that bottom pod. And then our last one was set out at a little bit less of an angle, so more of this, the um, a serial setting for the draper. Now this is the blue line here. So this is our two different settings here for our with air, with the draper, with, with beans, and then for um, serial settings with air. As you can see, had a quite a dramatic difference in terms of how you set that angle. And, and that's one of the challenges, I think, in some of the setups out there is the manual adjustment for your, your header angle. But in this case, we were able to see that, yeah, it had quite a significant difference in terms of how that was uh, reducing our losses at our header itself. Um, Again, very similar to other findings, that air did make a difference across all header types that were reducing our losses by an amount that uh, we could see in the field. When you look at your overall, overall stats and where the losses were occurring, again, it's really that, that loose bean and drop pod, that's where the losses are occurring across all your speed settings, and that's the area that we've been focusing on, is understanding that interface and that variable and how it can affect your losses. In terms of uh, what is that doing across your different data sets, when you're looking at all speeds, well, this is how it works out in the wash. So about a, a half a bushel per acre by adding air to your auger header, and as well as when you're adding air to either your settings, if you're, you're maintaining a, a very steep angle for your bean compared to your serial setup, uh, it's very consistent in terms of how we're seeing that angle and effect and overall losses across all speed types. And in terms of your header treatment, yeah, we saved about uh, one bushel an acre just by doing an adjustment, trying to optimize that header angle for uh, losses. And again, Draper did make a difference, so I saw, definitely saw lower losses with the Draper compared to the serial uh, setting. Now, when you look at everything together, you take all your different header types or different header types and you add air, how much does that make a difference? Well, we saved, in this case, a half bushel an acre across all Draper versus an auger header or in, compared to an auger header. When you look at speed, how much does that make a difference? Uh, well, that does start to, to make a difference as well. In this case, we saw six mile an hour had our highest losses by about uh, three bushel an acre uh, compared to six and seven. So again, I always get a little bit concerned when I see seven mile an hour and seeing lower losses in six. Uh, it's a lot of material coming through uh, compared to uh, a little bit of, low, of a lower ground speed. So these are really our findings. When you're looking at your header setup, your draper header, for that steep angle for the bean setting can really make a difference or lower losses compared to, say, an auger header, as well as lower losses compared to a header that's not set up with a, a good angle for the draper itself or serial or auger uh, as well. An error system does reduce losses in all, all header types. Um, air definitely makes a difference for what we have seen, uh, regardless of of which you're doing and uh, which header type you're using and what kind of speed that you're running. And then lower, again, lower speeds tend to make a difference. So you can get to three and four, it's, it's less than 
that as you get up into that higher speed range. But again, it's always easy for me to say, looking at speed compared to pressures of harvest time and uh, how that uh, factors into uh, getting a crop off the field in a timely fashion. When you look at what's the cost, well, uh, can I pay this back? If you're looking at 1,000 acres per year and the draper system being over, over 15 grand, you're about a three-year payback. I guess one of the things you look at too is how long are you going to keep it? What's your potential savings or increased revenue after it's been paid back? And you can say, well, if I'm doing 1,000 a- thousand acres per year, about 6,000 6, per year in terms of an annual uh, increase in revenue as you're going. Um, if I'm setting my header up and I... I don't take the time to get it set up correctly, I'm not stopping to check, how can that affect me? Well, it can have a dramatic impact in terms of what your, um, what your cost could be. At 10 bush an acre, it could be 15 bucks an acre you're leaving behind just by not getting your header set up and not getting that optimized for the conditions and the varieties that you're in. Uh, one note, I'll, I'll make just a quick comment about some of the other work that we're doing at PAM in terms of header losses and soybeans, working with the Manitoba Pulse and soybean growers, trying to understand the effect of rolling and how that uh, can impact your overall stand development your, uh, and, and what that does for losses at the front end. If you have stones in your field, absolutely, you're going to be rolling. If you're into the Red River Valley areas and there aren't a stone in sight and you're still rolling, the question is, is it helping me or what's that doing overall for my potential? Uh, so we have one-year trials. We're, we'll have a second year coming up, I guess, just couple quick notes of things that we have seen. We have seen a little bit of a difference in terms of what that plant height is looking at when you have a, uh, unrolled, uh, an unrolled condition. So a slightly taller plant and that bottom pot is actually a little bit higher off the ground, which is a bit of a surprise to us. So we're going to go back to the field again in 2019 and start to look at some of these variables and how that plays into your header losses at, at various, uh, in various conditions in Manitoba. Um, other part to this is looking at header loss, and I'll just throw a couple slides in some, from some of the work that we've done in Saskatchewan, looking at straight cut canola and effective header type and how that plays into the conversation of what am I running for my operations here in Manitoba. Um, There's a three-year trial done in Saskatchewan, 2014 to 2016, and looking at different, different types of uh, varieties, some standard uh, hybrid varieties compared to uh, a pod shatter resistant variety. And then looking at different header types uh, on uh, a very feed a rigid header as well as a draper and a belt pickup in comparison for that. So one of the things we want to understand is, is there effect in terms of your rotary compared to vertical knife compared to a fixed uh, divider on these different types of headers and looking at losses in canola and, and what's that overall impact in terms of your efficiency for, um, for operation. And this is one of the things that uh, we try to compile all the information into one overall slide. And you're looking at a standard non-shatter resistant variety. Um, these are the results that we saw. Draper header with rotary divider uh, had fairly high losses. The rigid header, the vertical knife divider, had the highest losses in these cases. Uh, when you're looking at uh, your overall difference, um, your Shatter resistant varieties definitely performed better and had lower losses compared to uh, a standard variety, uh, relatively speaking, across all different uh, header types. Um, when you're looking at where are these losses occurring, well, this is uh, uh, a, a cross section to try and show where these are occurring. So, this would be the side of the knife, this is right by the feeder house, and then another side. One of the things that we did find that the uh, rotor dividers had a greater overall loss um, compared to a vertical knife. And on the fixed dividers, one of the interesting things is it, it wasn't consistent across the width of the header. There's a greater loss on the, uh, the knife drives. There's more of a protrusion into your crop and that seems to affect and reduce or impact some of your losses and, and increase your losses uh, on that particular side of the, uh, the header itself. I was hoping to have a little bit of time for questions if anybody had a question on uh, any, either the soybean or the canola work that we've done. I also have some other, some other slides if there was time to look at some of the straight cut canola, but I uh, wanted to take a break here and, and give a chance for questions if anybody had in terms of uh, any of the information that on the soybean losses for header. Got a question here? Yeah. 
Right. right. The question was about the air system for for in uh, straight cut canola. Yeah, we uh, you'd have to get it out of the way in order to get it through the, the crop canopy. Um, in the, when we were doing our trials, we tilted it out of the way for the for the crop, for the uh, doing any kind of work inside the field. But yeah, for canola, you have to get the fingers out of the way for that. I, I'm using air system interchangeably. An air reel would be a, a slightly different style setup where it actually has air through the center uh, center tube of the reel itself. Um, air knife, air system are kind of the that's the term that I would use for the, the style that has the bar, the tube across the front and the fingers coming down in front of the knife. So just for clarity in terms of uh, what I'm talking, air system or air knife. Yeah. Are there any questions? If anybody, uh, if you're willing to talk a little bit about uh, straight cut canola, we'll just uh, flip into that if, if we have time. One of the things that we wanted to show was some of the work that we've done here in the last couple of years, looking at the different effect on uh, using different types of pre-harvest aids. I want to say thanks to our project partners as well, as uh, without them it's impossible for us to do the work that we, we do and hopefully ask, give information back to producers in, in terms of how these types of systems and operations can affect overall profitability. So one of the things we want to understand was what is the effect of pre-harvest aids on losses, your overall field efficiency and operation, and then your impact on economics. So we've done two trials in this 2016-2017, looking at comparing swathing to straight cutting. And in the straight cut trials, we want to understand what's the impact we use Reglone compared to heat and glyphosate tank mix or let it naturally ripen. In 2017, we also added in just a straight glyphosate uh, treatment to understand is there any benefit to that. So this is how we lay our treatments out, working with um, a, uh, a cutting in between the sprayer tracks, working with the local producer and allowing us to play in his field. Taking a full width of cut was really critical for us as we're looking at overall yield losses or overall yield as one of the variables in this. Looked at two different uh, types of, of uh, canola 140p in 2016 and 233 in 2017. Again, I always want to do multiple replications to see if there's any uh, variation that comes from uh, looking at just a single, uh, single plot and giving that statistical significance to any of the work that we uh, are doing in the field. Um, and again, anything that we did was based on uh, recommendations for looking at, at uh, a chemical application and then in terms of harvest time, a, when the crop is ready for maturity. Uh, we used the calibrated away wagon for any of our, our yield data that we do in the field and then take an external GPS unit that we have and then pull in the CAN bus information off the combine for any kind of uh, fuel, uh, fuel consumption or engine load for this particular um, type of work. One of the things that I was really concerned about was loss prior to harvest time. So we have loss pans that we put in the field, put in standing canola prior to losses or prior to straight cutting, and then take them out as we're doing our trials. And then the second type of loss we're looking at is after the combine. So doing loss pans in this case across the width of the combine, doing a drop pan uh, in the center of the, of the com on the center of the combine, and then two additional ones to the outside, if looking at it, the full width of the header. Um, in 2016, we were using a, a 690 with a, a, a Macdon uh, FD75 flex head. Thanks, Macdon, for providing that for us. And then in 2017, we had a 35-foot uh, um, 135 header for this trial. So I'm going to try and break this up into two different uh, sections and bring it back together at the end. 2016 and 2017 were very different years. Um, we did our application of, of uh, heat and glyphosate August 24th using application rates recommended, and then reg loan on August 29th using a 25-gallon breaker uh, application rate. I one, say, one thing I would say about application is using the uh, amount of water recommended for that, trying to get the crop uh, or penetration through the crop canopy uh, and down into the plants. And these are the dates that we looked at in terms of days from planting and days of harvest from when we started to when we ended up uh, harvesting our, our trials in 2017 or 2016. One of the things about 2016, we had a real big wind event uh, here in just early September. It caused me great concern as I thought our loss pans would be filled with, uh, with canola. As it turns out, we did pretty good there and saw a low loss, uh, relatively speaking. 
Um, these are our dates that we used for when we sprayed uh, any of our treatments compared to when we harvested. So five days from when we did the reg loan compared to uh, when we harvested. Uh, we did get some rain that same weekend. This is the Labor Day long weekend, so our trials were essentially put off until we get back in the field towards the end of September with the remaining treatments taken at that point. Just a quick picture in terms of what the crop conditions were uh, when they came off in 2016. Now, we'll look at 2017. Now, 2017 is quite a different fall. August was hot and dry, and these were the dates that we used for in terms of uh, doing our chemical applications. Uh, so we had our spray date again uh, five days later from Reglone to when we harvested. In the case of uh, heat and glyphosate, August 20th, then we harvested 29th. And then glyphosate we did on August 15th, which was uh, earlier on in the season. One of the things you'll notice about those harvest dates is that they're all grouped together. And uh, that's one thing that we found in 2017 was really it was so hot and dry in August when you look at your overall uh, average temperature during August and lack of moisture that really had a, a great impact in terms of how the canola matured through 2017. And, and the overall impact maybe on your pre-harvest dates uh, wasn't as significant compared to 2016. When you're looking at how did the crop conditions for 2017 compare, well, this is uh, just a couple of photos of how the plots were when we'd take them off, and really wasn't a big difference just because it was so dry in August of that year. You can see uh, still some slight green in the stem, but uh, crop canopy was browned up and ready to go. So what does this mean in terms of yield? In this case, we didn't see a statistical effect really on, on our uh, seed characteristics including yield or standing losses. So that's one thing that I've heard anecdotally is that I've seen a dramatic increase in yield. In this case, we didn't see it in the two trials that we did here in 2016 and 2017. Not to say it's not there, but in our trials, that's, that's something that we didn't see a statistical effect on in terms of our overall output for that. When you look at what's the overall yield, well, these are what we found for our differences compared to swathing. So always use swathing as our baseline for any difference and uh, those are two different plots that we had in two different years. So you can see quite a dramatic difference in terms of our, our overall yield though between the two different years. And when you look at our losses, the shatter losses on the right hand side here were essentially negligible. We had very little losses here for anything that was uh, uh, prior to going in for, for combining. And these are differences relative to swathing when you look at our, our losses behind the combine. So we did see a, a slight variation, but not a significant difference in terms of overall um, losses. One of the things I like to look at in, when I'm in the field and, and looking at equipment is what's my overall efficiency in terms of bushels per liter, or my, uh, uh, to understand what's that fuel, is it being used for productive work? So we did a comparison looking at the different straight cut stripes, types compared to swathing for both 2016 and 2017. And again, that, that's one thing that we found with the two different years that that uh, fall conditions and, and plant uh, condition has a dramatic impact in terms of what the overall efficiency can be. So more green material, more engine load, and therefore you'll see that in terms of your bushels per, uh, per liter used. Um, the next aspect to that is oh, what am I harvesting on my bushels per liter? And that's where we saw, again, quite a bit of a difference in terms of our overall um, trials. Blue line being your productivity, so my bushels per hour that I'm taking off relative to my uh, the various aspects. In this case, we saw quite a bit, of, quite an increase when you look at straight cutting in terms of your overall efficiency per hour compared to swathing just by your ground speed and uh, overall losses and, and capture uh, of, of canola. 2017, very similar type of setup here as well where you see that real dramatic increase when you look at a uh, straight cut compared to a swath canola. Um, that's not the only story though, it also comes back to cost. So when you're looking at 2016, these are the results that we found in terms of when you look at an average application rate, cost per chemical. Um, it does make a difference when you're looking at that. Well, a comment I would say though, it gives opportunity for flexibility. It's not just about, I would say, straight cutting. Um, uh, it's not just about being able to straight cut, it's what else you're trying to do and manage your operations, riding glyphosate for, for weed kill at the end of the year. Um, it also has an impact in terms of what can you do for the operation and management of overall harvest operations? If, if uh, timing is critical, then yeah, there's opportunity to do that timing very uh, quickly and on a consistent basis with looking at some of the pre-harvest aids and uh, how that impacts uh, overall uh, operations. 
2017, these are the cost uh, summary that we had found, and especially in 2017, just because it was so hot, really there was no difference that we found in terms of our timing from any of the treatments compared to just straight cutting. Um, one of the things I would say though, it, this does, a uh, straight cut of canola does op open up, uh, it does open up some operational management and, and the opportunity to, to try and control some of the timing of operations um, and really risk, risk, risk management uh, strategy in terms of swathing compared to uh, straight cutting, compared to uh, uh, just leaving it naturally ripened. So that's some of the work that we've done here on straight cutting in Manitoba and uh, I'm not sure if I have time for questions. Well, that's, that's what I got if I have time, I guess, for a couple of questions if there was and if not then it's lunchtime. If there's no questions, okay. then thank you very much. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Lauren, for your time. And on behalf of Becky, thank you very Great, much. Thank you very much.